Welcome to Love the Truth Media, a teaching ministry of Pastor Steve Wiseman of Peewee Valley Baptist Church in Peewee Valley, Kentucky. To learn more about the many resources available through this ministry, visit us online at lovethetruthmedia.com. And now, here's Pastor Steve to continue our verse-by-verse study in the book of 2 Samuel. We left off last time at 2 Samuel 19 and verse 41. That's where we'll pick it up tonight. 2 Samuel chapter 19 and verse 41. Uh, uh, titled our message tonight, uh, Conflict Between Judah and Israel Intensifies. Uh, although the actual uh, separation into the northern and southern kingdom doesn't take place until um, about the 11th chapter of uh, 1 Kings, we see the, the beginning conflicts here uh, intensifying. So in these uh, last three verses of chapter 19, um, I call this bickering over rights. Bickering over rights. You ever do that? <laughs> You know, somehow we think we still have rights when we get saved. Uh, we don't have any rights. We gave them all up. Uh, <laughs> amen. Uh, we, we have a relationship with God. And we lost all of our rights. We're no longer our own. We belong to Him. So uh, we are, we're literally the doormat of the world, but yet we're the light of the world, if you will. Let's read verses 41 to 43 and come back and look at this. Uh, bickering over rights. In verse 41, And behold, all the men of Israel came to the king and said unto the king, that's David, Why have our brethren, the men of Judah, stolen thee away and have brought the king and his household and all David's men with him over the Jordan? And all the men of Judah answered the men of Israel, Because the king is near of kin to us. Wherefore then are ye angry for this matter? Have we eaten at all at the king's cost? Or have he, or hath he given us any gift? And the men of Israel answered the men of Judah, and said, We have ten parts in the king, and we have also more right in David than ye. Why then did ye despise that our advice should not be first had in bringing back our king? And the words of the men of Judah were fiercer than the words of the men of Israel. Sounds like a brawl out on the street, doesn't it? <laughs> Yeah, I have more rights than you do. No, I've got more rights than you do. And it just keeps escalating until somebody really gets angry. And that's what's happening here. Uh, remember that uh, Absalom, uh, having been killed, uh, now David moves back to Jerusalem. And, um, and the, the kingdom had been somewhat divided with Absalom taking, uh, winning the hearts of the people of Israel and of the tribe of Judah, David's people went over the Jordan with him uh, to escape out of Absalom's hand. And that's seemingly the contention here by the people of Israel, those who side um, with Absalom. Uh, they're saying, uh, you know, it's interesting because they, were, they gave their uh, affection and their allegiance to Absalom. And how soon now they come back and say, you know, why didn't you take our advice to bring David back? Kind of interesting, this turn of events happening so quickly. But in verse 41, it says, All the men of Israel came to the king and said to him, Why have our brethren of men, in other words, why have the people of Judah taken David away? They didn't even understand why David left. They just think the people of the southern kingdom just sort of swept him away from them. And so their, their intention was to indicate to the people of Judah that uh, we, we didn't go after Absalom voluntarily. We were sort of stuck with him because y'all whisked David off across the Jordan. So in verse 42, uh, the men of Judah responded to that accusation by the men of Israel. And they said, because uh, explaining why they did it, because the king is near of kin to us. Uh, David was from Judah, born in Bethlehem. And so he was... Um, he was of Judah, so these were the people of Judah, and they're saying, he's one of us. Um, and so then they responded back to the Israelites and said, 
Wherefore then are you angry for this matter? What's got you all up in a bundle about this thing? Um, and stating that they had not done this to gain any favor uh, from David himself. They, they haven't done it to try to get an advantage from him. So in verse 43, it escalated. And uh, the people of Israel then said, We have more of a right than you do to David. We've got ten parts. Uh, eventually, the kingdom divided into ten tribes in the north and two in the south. And uh, interestingly enough here, they're saying, we got ten parts in David. So five-sixths of him belong to us. They're claiming their rights here, if you will. They're bickering over in them, the two sides are. But they're saying, we have more right than you do. So because we have more right in David than you, uh, or more claim, you might say, then the end of verse 43 there, why then do you despise us that our advice should not be first had in bringing back our king? We'll look back earlier in this chapter to verse 9. And there's some, there's some meat behind what they're accusing Judah of here. It says in verse 9, and all the people were at strife throughout all the tribes of Israel, saying, the king saved us, speaking of David, out of the hand of our enemies, and he delivered us out of the hand of the Philistines. And how is he fled out of the land on account of Absalom? And Absalom, whom we anointed over us, is dead in battle. Now therefore, why speak ye not a word of bringing the king back? Or they gave their allegiance. It's just a street fight is what it is. They gave their allegiance to Absalom. And now, since Absalom's dead, oh, by the way, if he hadn't been dead, they wouldn't be changing back. But now that he's dead, they want David back and say, hey, we're the ones who first said he should come back. And oh, by the way, we have more of a right than you do because we've got ten tribes versus your one. So that's sort of how it was escalating at the end of verse 43. And the words of the men of Judah were fiercer than the words of the men of Israel. So this is a very heated conflict, uh, no doubt there in the public places. And it wasn't gaining, uh, it wasn't, it wasn't, wasn't gaining any benefit. They were just sort of at each other's throat over who had the greater claim and the greater right and why the other side didn't do what they should have done. We're right, they're wrong. Both sides said the same thing. Sort of what happens when we get into conflict, isn't it? I'm right and you're wrong. <laughs> I'm right and you're wrong. Um, well, sometimes we're right and sometimes we're wrong. But that's not the way, that's not the Lord's way of resolving issues. I can assure you of that. So, uh, the next section here, which begins uh, on the first part of chapter 20, uh, I call it uh, a Benjamite-led insurrection. Uh, interestingly, um, Saul was from Benjamin. Saul was from Benjamin. And so, uh, here's a Benjamite who now leads a, an insurrection against David and the people of Judah. So this no doubt precipitated from the uh, bickering that was taking place recorded in chapter 19. Let's read the first 15 verses of chapter 20, then we'll come back and look at them. And there happened to be there, there happened to be there, uh, a man of Belial whose name was Sheba, the son of Bichri, a Benjamite, and he blew a trumpet and said, We have no part in David, neither have we inheritance in the son of Jesse. Every man to his tents, O Israel. So every man of Israel went up uh, from after David and followed Sheba, the son of Bichri. But the men of Judah, um, they clave unto their king from the Jordan even to Jerusalem. And David came to his house at Jerusalem, and the king took the ten women, his concubines, whom he had left to keep the house, and put them in uh, ward, and fed them, but went not in unto them. So they were shut up unto the day of their death, living in widowhood. Then said the king to Amasa, Assemble the men of Judah within three days, and be thou here also present. And Amasa went to assemble the men of Judah, and he tarried longer than the set time which he had appointed him. And David said to Abishai, another one of his commanders, Now shall Sheba the son of Bichri do us more harm than did Absalom. Take thou thy Lord's servants and pursue after him, lest he get for himself fenced cities and escape us. And there went out after him Joab's men and the Cherethites and the Pelethites. 
and all the mighty men, and they went out of Jerusalem to pursue after Sheba, the son of Bichri. When they were at the great stone, which is in Gibeon, a mesa went before them, and Joab's garment that he had on was, was girded unto him, and upon it a girdle with a sword fastened upon his loins in its sheath, and as he went forth it fell out. And Joab said to Amasa, Art thou in health, my brother? And Joab took Amasa by the beard and the right hand to kiss him. But Amasa took no heed to the sword that was in Joab's hand, so he smote him with it in the fifth rib and shed out his uh, bowels to the ground and struck him not again, and he died. So Joab and Abishai, his brother, pursued Sheba, the son of Bichri. And one of Joab's men stood by him and said, He who favoreth Joab, and he who is for David, let him go after Joab. And Amasa wallowed in his own blood in the midst of the highway. And when the man saw that all the people stood still, he removed Amasa out of the highway into the field and cast a cloth upon him. And when he saw that, everyone who came by him uh, stood still. When he was removed out of the highway, all the people went on after Joab to pursue Sheba, the son of Bichri. And he went through all the tribes of Israel unto Abel and to Bethmaacah and all the Beerites. And they were gathered together and went also after him. And they came and besieged him in Abel of Bethmaacah. And they cast up uh, a, a bank uh, and all the people uh, against the city. And it stood... Uh, and it stood in the trench, and all the people who were with Joab battered the wall to throw it down. I call this the insurrection led by the Benjamite here. Now, the first thing to know about this guy Sheba, who leads the insurrection, is that he happened to be there. <laughs> Interesting. But more importantly, this man of Belial simply means that he was a rabble rouser. He was a worthless person. Uh, he had no value um, in, in that which he claimed to be, and that is a leader of a political party or of an insurrection. So anyway, he was the son of a Benjamite, so he was of the tribe of Benjamin, like Saul was. So he blew a trumpet. Now, interestingly, uh, the people of Israel said, back in verse 43 of chapter 19, we have ten parts in the king, we have also more right in David than you do. What is it that Sheba says in verse 1 of chapter 20? We have no part in David. He completely contradicts everything that was just said by the men of Israel. We have no part in David. In fact, he emphasizes the point at the end of the verse and says, um, neither have we inheritance in the son of Jesse. Well, that's David, the son of Jesse. We don't have any inheritance there. Uh, perhaps... Um, perhaps a dig into those from Judah who said, well, he's a kinfolk to us. So they're saying, we don't have, this guy says, we don't have any part in him. And he, he shouts out the battle call, every man to his tents. But look what happened. This worthless fellow, um, he, he makes a claim, blows a trumpet, calls everybody to go back to their tents, and so in verse 2, every man of Israel literally withdrew from following David, and they followed Sheba. How quickly they turned. I mean, he ran after Absalom. As soon as he's dead, they're back running with David. And some guy who they don't even respect comes out and says, every man of the tents, we don't have any part in David. We're going to go on our own here. There they go. They're off and running. You know, their, their temperament is one where they just sort of go in the direction that the wind blows today. <laughs> There's some folks I know like that. <laughs> so, every man went from following David, uh, but the men of Judah remained steadfast um, toward their king from the Jordan even to Jerusalem. So David came to his house at Jerusalem. He locks up his uh, concubines uh, in confinement, that's what that word ward means, and he fed them, took care of them, but basically widowed them uh, there in confinement. No doubt, because Absalom, remember, came to town and he slept with the concubines. As a visible symbol to the people of the city, 
that he had now possession, possession of the throne. So David first handles that when he gets to Jerusalem and uh, locks them up. So in verse 4, then the king says to Amasa, who's this guy, Amasa? Uh, if you look back in verse 13 of chapter 19, and say to Amasa, thou art not of my uh, bone and of my flesh, art thou not of my bone and of my flesh, God do so to me and more also if thou be not captain of the host before me continually in the place of Joab. So Amasa was appointed commander by Absalom. So then when Absalom's dead, David appoints him as commander. So David in chapter 20 and verse 4 says to Amasa, who is his commander in place of Joab, by the way, um, he tells him to get the men of Judah together and, and take three days to do it, and then basically we're going to assault the, and, and try to stop this insurrection. So in verse 5 of chapter 20, Amasa went to assemble the men of Judah, but he tarried longer than the set time which he had appointed him. That sort of brings into question what his intentions are. Or did he run into some trouble somewhere along the way? Nobody knows, but he's taken longer than he should have. So what does David do? David turns to another of his commanders, the second in line, Abishai, and says to Abishai, now shall Sheba, the son of Bichri, do us more harm than did Absalom. Take thou the Lord's servants and pursue after him, lest he get for himself fenced or fortified cities and escape us. Time is of the essence. I uh, don't know what's going on with the Mesa. Abishai, get the men together and let's go out to war. And so in verse 7, there went out after him Joab's men. Remember, Amasa was supposed to be the commander who replaced Joab. Abishai is given direction to take over for Amasa because they don't know where he is, don't know what his whereabouts is. And so he gets Joab's men with him. And the Cherethites and the Perethites, we talked about that in chapter 8, but these are basically the David's bodyguards. These are adjectives, not actual names of inhabitants of particular cities or with a certain uh, nationality. They're adjectives, and they basically speak of the bodyguards uh, for the king. So Joab's men, David's bodyguards, and all the mighty men, and they went out of Jerusalem to pursue after Sheba, the son of Bichri. Well, before they get to Sheba, something else happens. And we see this in verse 8. When they were at the great stone, which is in Gibeon, now this is known to be about eight miles northwest of Jerusalem, so they've gone about eight miles in Benjamin there. Uh, Amasa went before them, and so they catch up with Amasa. Uh, and Joab's garment that he had put on was girded unto him, and upon it a girdle with the sword fastened upon his loins, and its sheath, and as he went forth, it fell out. Some believe that he intentionally dropped the sword. He's a man of war. He's not a guy that, um, that accidentally drops a sword. Uh, but anyway, his sword falls out, and Joab goes up to embrace Amasa. Interestingly, Joab's quite a character, as we know. Now keep in mind, David sent out who? Amasa to lead this charge. There's a delay that's longer than what David anticipated, so he turns to Abishai and sends him out. Where's Joab? He's left out. So Joab is, shows up on the scene here, and he says to Amasa, uh, Art thou in health, my brother? And he took, uh, Joab took him by the beard with the right hand to kiss him. Ready to show some affection to him with a sword. He takes his sword, uh, according to verse 10, but Amasa took no heed to the sword that was in Joab's hand. He had dropped it, so he reaches down to pick up his sword, no doubt, some speculate that he probably intentionally dropped the sword so that in the picking, uh, picking it up, he wouldn't have to take it out of its sheath, but he would, just, he would just nicely pick it up and just thrust it through the fifth rib of, um, of a mesa there. So he does, and one stab, and it was all over. The interesting thing is that a mesa... Uh, and you might think, well, maybe Joab did this because Amasa had tarried longer than he should have. Maybe he didn't have intention to fulfill David's desire. So you might even think that he's guilty of treason to some extent. 
And if you're in favor of Joab, you might come up with that line. One thing we know is he grabs the sword and he kills him uh, with one thrust of the sword. And in the middle of verse 10, shed out his bowels, literally his inwards, his, his innards, as we called them back in the country, uh, spilled out on the ground. He didn't strike him again with the sword, but he died. Joab and Abishai, his brother, pursued Sheba, the son of Bichri. And interestingly enough, it's not indicated Abishai and Joab, but Joab now is first. Joab's going to be the one to take control wherever he goes. That's his pattern we've seen over the last several chapters of our study. But here's another point. So Joab, Abishai's brother, pursued Sheba, the son of Bichri. Now, uh, this Amasa... Um, he's, uh, he's related to David. He's a nephew of David. And there's not even a funeral for him here. It says, um, uh, Amasa took no heed to the sword. And so anyway, Joab and Abishai pursued Sheba, verse 11. And one of Joab's men stood by him. Uh, that is the one who's in the street. That's Amasa dying. And it says, he who favoreth Joab, and he who is for David, let him go after Joab. So one of Joab's men announces immediately that Joab's in charge, and all of you folks that were following Amasa, get in line with, with uh, Joab here. And so in verse 12, Amasa wallowed, so there's some wriggling of the body as he's dying in the middle of the street. And when the man saw all the people that they were standing still, he took a mesa out of the highway, put him off into a field, and covered him up with a cloth. There's not even a decent burial for the man. No respect. So they just sort of push him. We call it kicking it to the curb, right? Um, and he cast the cloth on him, and when he saw that everyone who came by him you know, just kept standing there, they were still still, it says, when he was removed out of the highway, all the people went after Joab to pursue Sheba, the son of Bichri. So he had to get the man out of the way. He was impeding progress here. And so get him out of the way, put a cloth over him, forget about him now, we got a task. Wouldn't you like to think that your life meant a little more than that? Uh, and there's no indication that a Mesa wasn't doing what David told him to do. Uh, it just says the Mesa went before them in verse 8. So in verse 14, uh, he, that is Sheba, the tension now goes back to Sheba, the one they're pursuing, and he went through all the tribes of Israel. Keep in mind, he's a self-proclaimed leader who's trying to lead an insurrection against David, who is the king. So he takes it upon himself to go through all the tribes of Israel to try to win support, and he goes to this place called Abel, Beth Maacah. Uh, the city's known as Abel, but it's in Beth Maacah. Uh, the, the city, Abel Beth Maacah, uh, is full name, means meadow of the house of oppression. Meadow of the house of oppression. So it seems to be an oasis in the midst of a lot of trouble. That's actually the name of the city. So uh, now this uh, Abel, we'll call it, is uh, about 115 miles north of Jerusalem. It's at the very northern, uppermost part, as far away as you can get from Jerusalem, and still be in, um, in Israel. So that's where he ended up. Um, and all the Beerites, and they were gathered together and went also after him. And so in verse 15, they came and besieged him uh, in Abel of, uh, of Bethmaacah, and they cast up a bank against the city, and it uh, stood in the, in the trench, and all the people who were with Joab battered the wall to throw it down. So they, the way they would, had a, a walled city, Abel was, and this was a very, it was a metropolis. It was a big city. It was a very important city. And they had mounded up. They started mounding up things against the wall so that they could breach the wall and get in and take the city. And that's what they were in the midst of doing as we end with verse 15 there. So we're going to read verses 16 to 26 and talk about this bloody battle being prevented. I call it the bloody battle prevented. So reading verse 16 down to the end, it says, Then cried a wise woman out of the city, Hear, hear, say, I pray you, unto Joab, 
Come near hither that I may speak with thee. And when he was come near unto her, the woman said, Art thou Joab? And he answered, I am he. Then she said unto him, Hear the words of thine handmaid. And he answered, I do hear. Then she spoke, saying, They were uh, wont to speak uh, in old time, saying, They surely... Uh, They shall surely ask counsel at Abel, and so they ended the matter. I am one of them who are peaceable and faithful in Israel. Thou seekest to destroy a city and a mother in Israel. Why will thou swallow up the inheritance of the Lord? And Joab answered and said, "Far um, far, Far be it from me that I should swallow up or destroy. The matter is not so, but a man of Mount Ephraim, Sheba, the son of Bichri, by name, hath lifted up his hand against the king, even against David. Deliver him only, and I will depart from the city. And the woman said unto Joab, Behold, his head shall be thrown over thee, thrown to thee over the wall. Then the woman went unto all the people in her wisdom, and they cut off the head of Sheba, the son of Bichri, and cast it out to Joab. And he blew a trumpet, and they retired from the city, every man to his tent. And Joab returned to Jerusalem unto the king." We won't read the rest of those verses in the chapter right now. So, what we have here, uh, Joab and his men get to the city. They've got the mounds up. They're ready to breach the walls. And from across the wall, they hear this woman shouting out, uh, basically, to stop. And that's what we see here in the end of verse 16. I pray uh, pray you unto Joab, come near, hither may I speak with thee. When he was come, she said, are you Joab? He said, I am. She said, hear the words of thine handmaid, and he answered, I do hear. So she got his attention. And so she spoke this in verse 18. Uh, They were wont, the word means accustomed, as we would say it today. They were accustomed to speak in uh, the old time, saying, they shall surely ask counsel at Abel. In other words, Abel was uh, a place that was known for wisdom and sound judgment. And uh, when people went to this meadow in the land of oppression, if you will, uh, they found wise counsel uh, that stopped many a conflict, evidently. And they were well known uh, abroad uh, for their ability to resolve conflict. Um, And so Abel was known as a city where you could go and get good counsel. Uh, Today, in, in, in most business circles, they use people called mediators to try to mediate differences, uh, all kinds of differences in the workplace. Um, and so these mediators are third party, unbiased, not prejudiced, not involved in the matter, no equity in the situation. They go to mediators and a mediator listens to both sides and tries to get the two sides to see each other's way. And they try to broker a deal where they can both come to the point where they can resolve the matter without taking the necessary actions they thought were appropriate before they went to the mediator. So this was a town of, where mediation was known to be successful and they were sought out from afar. It says there, they shall surely ask counsel at Abel. And she says in verse 19, I am one of them who are peaceable and faithful. Perhaps uh, being a wise woman uh, that we see here that Uh, She was likely a judge in the city that was well respected. Uh, It says in verse 22, the the woman went unto all the people in her wisdom. Um, So she was was likely uh, a judge and, and well respected and successful at doing so. And she said, I am one of them who are peaceable and faithful in Israel. So they sought peace. And we know that believers are supposed to be peacemakers and... We see here that uh, she speaks for the people of the city that they had remained loyal to Israel throughout their time. They were faithful in Israel. So they were known uh, to be uh, ones that where, where you could seek counsel and find good counsel, resolve a matter, uh, to get peace. And they were remaining faithful to Israel and their purposes. And it says, you seek to destroy a city, the city would be able um, and a mother in Israel. The mother is not her. The mother is a, a specially honored city in those days that was well respected and recognized, perhaps a capital of the region, uh, but certainly a city where um, there was uh, help to be had. 
And so she talks to Joab and says, you're in here to try to destroy a city that actually stands for something. Maybe you should stop. So she says that here. She says, why will thou swallow up the inheritance of the Lord? Now, look at, hold your place. Look back at Deuteronomy chapter 20. There were some uh, rules of engagement that Israel had uh, in the law. And although these, these rules of engagement that we'll see in Deuteronomy chapter 20 were for other countries, not necessarily within the confines of Israel, they certainly should apply there as well. And in Deuteronomy chapter 20 and verse 10, uh, the scripture says, When thou comest nigh unto a city to fight against it, then proclaim peace unto it. In other words, uh, this wise woman is following the, the counsel of the Lord that when you go to a place to destroy it, try to get peace before you destroy it. If you think there's a reason to destroy it, try to get peace first. And verse 11, And it shall be, if it make thee an answer of peace, um, and open unto thee, then it shall be that all the people who are found therein um, shall be servants or, uh, unto thee, and they shall serve thee, and it will make no peace. And if it will make no peace with thee, but will make war against thee, then thou shalt besiege it. That's well, a pretty simple principle. Try to make some peace, and if you can't make peace, and you've got, you've got a good reason to siege the city, go ahead. Um, and so that counsel or may be behind her words of wisdom here, as we go back to our text, because she does say, why will you swallow up the inheritance of the Lord? Uh, after all, this is the land of Israel. It's the in inheritance that God gave to his people. Why are you going to destroy that? And oh, by the way, we've been faithful to Israel here, and we're known as a city of peace. So in verse 20, Joab at least listened to her wisdom and said to her, far be it, far be it from me that I should swallow up or destroy. Of course, that's just after he killed a Mesa, right? Uh, but he, he listens to her wisdom, and he backs off, and he, he says, the matter is not so. Um, basically, what he's saying is, I don't want the city, I want Sheba. And I believe that's really what he wanted. But the interesting thing is that we get so tied up in our anger, we get so wrapped up in our wrath, and are wanting to, to accomplish something, that we destroy everything in the way to get it. That's really where Joab was. We need somebody to sort of slap us in the face and give us a wake-up call and say, wait a minute, why don't you abate that anger and let's look at this thing in the eyes of the Lord and see what we should be doing here. So Joab says, well, it's really not that way. I'm, it's not really the city. Because he was so wrapped up, he's ready to take the city. They already had the mounds up against the wall. They were ready to go over the wall. They were going to destroy the city to get to Sheba. And so for him to say, uh, the matter is not so in verse 21, is probably an honest answer because he just got wrapped up in his anger. He was actually going to do what she accused him of doing, that is destroying the city. But at least he listened to the sound wisdom of the lady that the Lord no doubt put in the way. And so the Lord appointed a wise woman uh, to stand in the gap and to be um, a spokesperson and to remind Joab that there's a, there's a different cause than what you're really trying to do here. So he says, this is really not so, but a man of Mount Ephraim, Sheba, the son of Bichri by name, hath lifted up his hand against the king. He started an insurrection. Uh, he started a revolution. He's trying to revolt against the king and be rebellious and said, This guy has lifted up his hand against the king, even against David. Deliver him only, and I will depart from the city. So she says, very wisely, we'll throw his head over the wall. <laughs> so she goes back and she brokers with the people of Israel inside the city there, the inhabitants of the city. Uh, and no doubt Sheba's hiding in there. They bring him out, take his head off, toss it across the wall over to Joab. That ends the debate. And if you and and when you when you think about what Joab said, what he said is, I'm really after Sheba because he's led an insurrection against David, the king. And oh, by the way, knowing that she just said they're faithful to Israel, if she's faithful to Israel 
then she's got to do something with Sheba, and she does. And in her wisdom, uh, that certainly would stop it, wouldn't it? And we look at it little things a little differently today. Uh, you know, capital punishment isn't something that most people favor today, although it's, on the, it's the law in many of the states and commonwealths in our United States. But there are many, many a person who don't like the idea of capital punishment, but it emanates from the scriptures itself. And, uh, and for crimes uh, such as what Sheba had committed, it's a worthy punishment. And no doubt the wise woman knew that as well. Anybody who lifts up a hand against the king deserves to be beheaded. So she tosses the head across the wall, or at least she has it tossed across the wall. Uh, it says in verse 22, The woman went unto all the people under wisdom. They cut off the head of Sheba, the son of Bichri, and cast it out to Joab. And as soon as he saw the head come across the wall, he blew the trumpet and called off the troops. And he said, Every man go back to his tent. So Joab returned to Jerusalem unto the king. And thus the, the insurrection has been squashed and the bloody battle has been prevented by a very wise woman. And we'd be wise to listen to the wisdom of the world that gets in, uh, that gets in as God. And, and no doubt God intervened here with this lady there in, in Abel. And um, I wrote down, just so, sort of summarizing these three points, we like to claim rights. We have some rights that we want to claim. And we get pretty, we get pretty uh, excited about those rights. Uh, we've seen that battle over the Confederate flag. We just had this brought up. There are people that they get real excited for a cause and they go, I've got a right to this. I've got a right to bear arms. I've got a right to fly a flag. I've got a right uh, to speak out against homosexuality. I've got a right. So we want, we're busy claiming our rights. And then, like Sheba did, we start usurping authority based on our claiming of rights. And so people take matters into their own hands. And, and they try to resolve matters in their own way. I know when, when abortions were first legalized, there were people uh, who claimed we have a right to stop abortions. And they usurped authority by going in and killing the doctors who were performing the abortions. Well, that's not legal in our land. We can't take those matters into our own hands. We take them to the Lord in prayer. God is the avenger of all this evil. So why do we want to take charge all of a sudden? So we want to claim our rights. We want to usurp authority so that we can exercise those rights. And that's what we see at the end of it. Is, uh, and of course, we have this, uh, and this is what we need, is the lady who exercised wisdom not her authority. She exercised wisdom. That's where we need to be. So we need to stop claiming the rights and, exer and, and usurping authority to have our own way about things because we think it ought to be that way. And the next murder, the next, you know, the, the next rebellious act will be somebody probably taking matters into their own hands and usurping the authority and saying, I've got the right to go kill somebody for this thing because nobody else is doing it. They're just sort of letting people do what they want to do. So people will go out and start killing homosexuals. They'll start doing it. Uh, but they're usurping the authority. What we need to do is we need to exercise wisdom. But what happens is, you know, the scripture says, be angry, be angry, but sin not. <laughs> be angry. We can get all excited. We can get angry about it, but don't sin in the process. Didn't Jesus get angry one time when he got the whip and went into the into the temple and started chasing out the money changers. He tossed over tables and he's slapping the whip at them. Boy, I just, I many times just sit there with my eyes closed and try to envision what that looked like. You read that passage of Scripture, close your eyes and see what's going on. And it's not Jesus going up and talking about love. It's done out of love, but it's righteous indignation. It's righteous anger. And we can exercise righteous anger. But he chased him out of the temple. Chased him out. And oh, by the way, he has the authority to do that because he's God. Uh, but we need to exercise wisdom. That's what we need to do. Instead of exercising our anger, we need to exercise our wisdom. And let that be a lesson to all of us. And Joab, in all of his anger, he's ready to destroy a whole city because of this one guy. Innocent people. 
because they're going to defend their city. The inhabitants of Abel, they were going to defend their city because he's making an assault on their city. They're going to defend the city. So it had been a bloody battle there, but it was prevented by just a few words of wisdom from a very wise lady that God put in the way. And you know, there are some people in our lives that can give us some words of wisdom. And may we even be the source of wisdom as that city was known to be by its inhabitants and their loyalty to Israel and their no doubt their obedience to the commands of God. So let's exercise some wisdom in the face of all of this and stop exercising our rights uh, and usurping the authority that's around us. Let's stand together. Father, we thank you for instructing and teaching us from your word tonight. We thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit that um, has, has reached into our hearts to, to show us your love, to show us your way, to show us your wisdom. And Father, as we see the events unfold in this biblical passage, uh, we can even envision some things going on in our own lives uh, that may be closely parallel that, where wisdom would certainly be the, the right choice for us instead of continuing on uh, with this rage or anger that so easily besets us. So, Father, teach us to be calm uh, with, uh, with the peace that passes understanding from the Lord, not anxious in anything, but using prayer to reach the throne of grace. We know we have access to you, Father. But all that's done, we pray, will be done in your will and for your glory and for your honor, that it might please you. Watch over and keep us on our way throughout the week and uh, give us traveling mercies as we travel. And uh, we lift up all of these prayer requests again, all of these people that are in need. Father, that you would touch each one with your healing power. In accordance with your will, Father, we lift them up to you, asking uh, on their behalf for mercy. We give you thanks and praise for all that you'll do in our midst, for it's in Christ's name that we ask it. Amen.